much. It's easy to think, oh, I've got uncertainty on the horizon. I'm going to stop spending. Yeah. But all that happens is you lose momentum. Last week on Marketing Trek, I was joined by a friend of the show from uh, previous seasons and the extraordinarily knowledgeable and entertaining data scientist, Steve Millman. And together, we discussed data ethics in marketing. In our conversation, Steve identified why governments struggle to legislate when it comes to data. He explained how businesses should try to balance the legal versus ethical standards of behavior when it comes to data. And he also talked a little bit about how data is being utilized to make digital products like social media more addictive. The companies use data to persuade people to spend longer on their platforms. But he also pointed out when it comes to that, that actually marketers have been doing that for eons. And I cut my teeth in the PR industry looking at impulse and distress purchase. And it's exactly what we do. How do you persuade people to do more, to buy more? That's what marketers do. So ultimately, it all comes down to personal responsibility. It's your data. Be careful what you're doing with it. Anyway, look, it was a fascinating episode, and I think it's essential listening for anyone who's involved in anything to do with data. So if you haven't listened to it, you have already missed out. But the good news is it's still there on your favorite pod platform, so you can go back and give it a listen. Now, for today's episode, we are kicking off a six-part limited series titled Resisting Recession. In this season, we're going to talk to six different, very interesting people from very different backgrounds about how they think marketers should be responding to recession. And our first guest in the series is Steve Lemon, who is a partner at UK-based venture capital firm Volution. So today, we're going to dive into the UK investment environment. In our conversation, Steve tells me about the amazing journey he went on as a founder one of the founders of Currency Cloud, Unicorn, and how they later sold it for the billion plus price point to one of their original investors. We also discuss what's happening in the UK fundraising environment right now, and Steve explains why businesses shouldn't be cutting marketing. Later on the show, I'm going to ask Steve how Brexit is affecting B2B tech in the UK and what the government needs to do to support businesses. But before that, let's learn a little bit more about Volution and what they do. Here's how it went. Steve, hi. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about you, the company and your current role? Volution is a VC. We have a very particular part of the market that we invest in. Volution is typically another turn of the handle and we provide extension capital to firms that are perhaps running out of runway after their last institutional funding round. We have a view that the European and certainly the UK venture markets are fragmented and overly siloed. The funding market typically is very stage specific depending on how mature a particular company is. But that doesn't necessarily work for entrepreneurs and founders. I joke about this all the time in my previous company, Currency Cloud, we sold for a a billion dollars to Visa, which seems a very pithy way of summarizing 13 years worth of hard work. But behind every billion dollar exit to a company like Visa, there are three or 400 companies that don't quite get that far. And that's because more often than not, they just don't have access to the right amount of capital on a basis that makes sense at the right time. And we provide extension capital to help them get to the next funding round. It strikes me that Volution might be in exactly the right place at the right time time at the moment because the big issue certainly some of our SaaS clients have right now is they're in between those funding rounds and as you rightly say the gap is pretty big and there's that kind of default a live default dead piece where if you can't make it to funding then your whole existence is kind of threatened so and you've got amazing names Zopa and Cognizant and Signal and you know Dudel and these are all companies I I know and have done work with so an amazing portfolio what does the future look like? We happen to agree with you my former CEO always used to say this, good companies will always get funded and bad companies don't. There's a yeah. natural selection. But that said, in the current climate in particular, it is challenging. It is very, very hard. And a lack of access to capital shouldn't be the reason that a company fails. That said, you shouldn't continue to fund companies yeah. that are just not good companies. Yeah. But that, that's the skill in becoming a, of a professional investor, I guess. And there's, there's a difference, obviously, in the risk appetite and the style of investment between a VC and a private equity company. But do you see those worlds merging a little bit as the hunger for the good quality deals increases? Mm, traditionally, venture has been, well, I mean, it still is. It, 
generally investing in a company much earlier stage yeah. in its life. Whereas private equity is, my colleagues in private equity won't thank me for saying this, they, they, <laughs> they invest on spreadsheets. Yeah. So it's it's all about the performance of the company and, and, and literally all about the numbers and where they can drive efficiencies yeah. from a top-down level. Whereas venture is a lot more bottom-up, actually. You're, you're looking at the people, you're looking at the, the, the problem they're solving, yeah. you're looking at the unique solution they've got, and you're looking at the potential for the business. Whereas private equity is all about how can we take cost out, how can we optimize? Yeah. Yep. Private equities do a lot of roll-up strategy, yeah, um, exactly, just yeah. taking superfluous, repetitive cost out of a business. So it's, it is different. It okay. is different. And, and also, they're naturally a lot more conservative. Okay. They'll only invest in businesses that are already profitable and yes. already going concerns, whereas venture will provide the uh, the overhead. They're comfortable with a company that burns cash. So I, I know the story here, but no one else listening does. I and mean, you mentioned Currency Cloud beforehand. So the sort of second stage of each podcast we do under this theme is like, how did you get to where you are today? The answer is Currency Cloud. But just tell us a little bit about that amazing journey. It was extraordinary. We set the business up in 2009 in the wake of the financial crisis, thinking if we can get a fintech business up and running now if we can become a viable going concern now we'll be in a great place to, yeah. to build a global business how hard can it be well it turns out it was really 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 hard um but we got there in the end we basically built a platform to automate cross-border transactions and and we, we set about to answer two questions one why does it cost more money to send a payment to the United States than it would do to send a package of cash via UPS. Uh, if, you, if you think about all the hands that handle yeah, yeah. the respective transactions. And the second question is, why is there such opacity and inconsistency in foreign exchange pricing? Uh, previously, I was running a, a retail business for a foreign exchange brokerage and Mrs. Miggins sending a million pounds down to the south of France to buy her retirement home would be charging her 200 basis points. Yeah. But my colleagues on the other side of the building doing exactly the same size transaction for, for Joe FD that does a million euros every year, yeah. every month rather, um, he'd be charged 20 basis points yeah. just because he knows better. So yeah, it was very much a poacher term gamekeeper kind of story. So we set that up in 2009. This is before FinTech was FinTech. We were calling it New Finance back then. Realised we were on something with the automation that this, this new technology called the internet could provide us. This is before Amazon was the big monster that it is yeah. now, before Alibaba was. And we put something called an API in front of it. Oh, no idea what an API was at the time, but it actually became the forefront of our business. And we were the first to market with the ability to offer FX and payments through an API. And Embedded finance was was born out of that. We gave companies the ability to embed our functionality into a product or a service they were already offering their customer. Right place, right time, fortunately. But the, the funding market was tough for us as well. Uh, we, we thought we'd get our Series A away and that would it be it, downhill from here. But actually it wasn't. It was very, very hard. But we were very fortunate. We had some significant investors. We got the early stage specialist fintech investors to, to get us up and running. And then we took cash from SAP, Google Ventures, BNP Barabar, IFC, or the world bank and then visa which obviously then ultimately left to led to the uh, led to the exit which was great and you got lots of battle scars along the way obviously scaling the business and one or two changing yes. role a few times i guess and so now yes. in your position where you're investing in but presumably also advising others you you've got the experience now to be able to help them with some of the tough yes. calls they're going to have to make right so it's a cliche that you see quoted on LinkedIn all the time about every, behind every overnight success, there's yeah, yeah. like 15 years of yeah. hard work, blood, sweat and tears. But actually to go through that and live it and realise what, what the detail behind that pithy statement actually means, yeah. you'd never do it. You'd never, yeah. you'd, ne you'd never go on that journey if you knew what it would involve. Yeah. Um, th th and just, just on a personal level, just the emotional roller coaster level, I mean, at times it's exciting, exhilarating, terrifying, lonely, and the silence can be deafening. Yeah. But your relationship personally and professionally with the business changes because you get to a point where you realize if we're going to grow this company, we need professional investment. But with professional investment becomes professional responsibility and yeah. you become an employee. Yeah, yeah. At best, you become an employee of your own company and they bring in the grown-ups to, to run the company yeah. because they want people that have done it before on a global scale. They don't want you learning on their on their dollar, so to speak. And that's fine. But then you more often than not, it's, it's a com common thing we found is you f find yourself reporting into a new CEO. Yeah. You're not running your own company anymore. Yeah. Um, the executive in charge of pencil shavings in the corner office. Exactly. It, was, it wasn't that bad. But I mean, look, the learnings were many and, and diverse. It was a great, great journey. And I was very fortunate to, to you know, start at the beginning and finish at the yeah. end not many people do. No, that's true, actually, uh, yeah. Very, true. very few yeah. people actually yeah. have the ability to 
or, or, or afforded the ability to, yeah. to, to go through the end. So it was a lot of fun, but yes, I've got a lot of scars on my Well, back. you've done it now. And that's why we're so delighted to have you here today, because the whole purpose of this podcast is to be giving advice to other people about this recession thing, if it even is one. So the economists are telling us that technically we're not in recession. and Well, we're not actually technically in recession, sorry. But things are really tough at the moment. We're definitely seeing things are tough. What challenges are you seeing in the market? Well, first of all, to your point, I, I think labelling it recession, not recession, inflation at 10%. I mean, these are all nonsensical figures. You know, these, these are measures and, and, and labels that were established generations ago almost. They're no, no longer fit for purpose in many ways. But to your point, yes, it's hard. It's yeah. really, really hard. We're seeing in our portfolio, we, we've got a, a mix of companies in our portfolio. Some, some are profitable and on the acquisition trail, which is why they want funding, because that's a nice problem to have. Others had to recut models to be a little bit more conservative in their, their growth ambitions so they could reach break even sooner and then take stock at that point. But we're very fortunate. We've got a young portfolio, as in the portfolio itself, not the company. So we, we don't have any uh, any any write-downs or anything like a, yeah. a lot of VCs. A lot of VCs, a lot of investors have had. But there's no doubt it is hard out there. And just, I, I, th I think the fundraising environment is probably a good canary down the, the coal mine for the state of the UK economy because it's very, very speculative funding, investing companies for, for growth as opposed to established behemoths. Um, you know, you, you can look at the, the FTSE and take a look at the, the, the numbers there, but that's, that's very, it's very... It's a different world, isn't it? It's I mean, a different it's just, world. It's very standard, very stable. It's not related to anything yep. and, in our um, world at all, is um, it? And maybe there'll be some headcount cut, but yeah. venture-backed businesses or investor-backed businesses are, are right at the, the sharp end, yeah. I think. And... There's no doubt the fundraising environment, we've noticed it, we're fundraising at the moment, we're closing off our first fund and then we're looking to, to raise fund too. And there's no doubt in in the time that's elapsed since I joined as a partner in the middle of last year, it's definitely got harder, noticeably. People are more conservative, people are taking longer to make decisions and just being a lot more circumspect about what they want to do. Yeah. Someone said one of the one of the challenges we're facing is that there are no prizes for making early decisions when the market's like it is. That actually just hold off a bit. Pause your decision making. You're not going to lose much, but you're not going to gain it by going early. And we're seeing that certainly that people are sitting on their hands quite a lot, taking a look around, seeing what's happening. They then might release some capital to do some marketing, for example. Thinking, oh, my God, there's a recession. Stop spending. Then they're thinking, oh, my God, all my competitors are still spending. I need to do something. And they're releasing a bunch of budget. But we're seeing a very stop start uh, economy at the moment. Uh, yeah, I, I have a view on that. So it's very easy to be nervous. It's an easy default state to reach. It's easy to think, oh, I've got uncertainty on the horizon. I'm going to stop spending. Yeah. But all that happens is you lose momentum. Okay. You start to stall in the water. If you, you know, yeah, you've yeah. Got your boat, a, a jet boat going off and you t turn the throttle off, then you start you start to slow down. Yeah. Um, and look, we're talking about marketing today. And my view is marketing is is the, the, the engine for any business in all facets of marketing. It's yeah. the engine room for any business. And yeah. the worst thing you can do is stop investing in your front of house stop investing in your 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 revenue engine because <laughs> if you if you could grow a business without the revenue engine firing on all cylinders you wouldn't have it in the first place so the, the fact that you've got it when times are good you definitely need it when times are tough yeah um that's that's a common misconception but it's easy to get comfortable with cutting overhead when things get a bit difficult but it's actually counterintuitive it's the last thing you should do in my opinion well it's interesting you mentioned momentum i mean you know without trying to reduce everything to like sort of crunchy sound bites but so much of getting a business up and running is about the story and the momentum and other people believing in you to give you an opportunity when probably you're not big enough to to take that opportunity yeah i mean certainly when we're talking about venture or well, my own business, actually, frankly, you know, the, the scale of clients that we're looking for. Momentum's important. That good news story constantly is really important. And I think if you cut that off, it's really hard to get the momentum back, I think. It is. And it's always a good opportunity to revisit where and how you're spending money. Yeah. It's a bit of a cliche and present company, I will say this, but it's very easy to spend too much money on marketing. It's very yeah. easy to get lazy with your allocation yeah. when, when times are good. And that's not to say that you shouldn't tighten it up and, 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 and sharpen your pencils and refocus on on, yeah. on on what you're doing. But cutting expenditure and marketing for the sake of cutting expenditure and marketing is, is, yeah. is the wrong thing to do. But you know, I don't think anyone would be considering that. But it's interesting. We were talking earlier about when setting up the business currency cloud. I, and when when you take the decision to to set out on your own and and, and leave a, a paycheck 
yeah, yeah. Uh, leave a company that is established and has got teams and functions doing particular roles and then you have to go and do everything yourself and you have to re- learn a lot of skills and, and, and find more time in the day to do all these things. That's a r- real shock to the system. And then obviously as the company grows and the business becomes more successful, you start gradually growing the different functions. You don't really recognize it growing or you don't realize it growing underneath. You don't realize your job just incrementally getting easier and easier because you've got functions focusing on specific things. But then again, when I left Currency Cloud with a multifaceted, very large, very sophisticated marketing team, and now coming back to Volution, which is a boutique investment firm, yeah. frankly, much smaller business, and we're all rolling our sleeves up and we're all drawing on our own skill sets and experiences again, and we're doing it ourselves, which in many ways is a, a, a lot of fun. It's the fun stuff. It is. It, it is the fun. Yeah, yeah. It is fun. But at the same time, it's like, oh, I haven't had to do this for a long time. <laughs> um, and it's hard work. But yeah, there is there is massive value in, in continuing to invest in your your revenue engine. This is a perfect place to take a prompt pause in the episode. This mini series is about how marketers should be responding to the recession, and Steve gives a great example of how we can all do that. Although he's speaking about the environment within his business, I think it's relatable and valuable for a lot of companies right now. This is a challenging environment. I like many of us are having to metaphorically roll up our sleeves and get stuck back in. You know, we're going to have to level up. We're going to have to get our businesses lean and efficient. And it's going to be hard. It's going to be challenging. But as Steve says, it doesn't mean you stop investing in marketing or your team. In fact, there's never a bad time to invest in your revenue engine because what you do now is what you're going to use to eat in six months' time. In the current climate, marketing is hard. But do you know what isn't hard? Making sure you never miss an episode of your favourite podcast. So tap the follow button on your podcast and you'll never miss out on the latest episodes of Unicorny or Marketing Difference. You can even go back and listen to our back catalogue of amazing episodes. If you do that, please leave us a review. It would mean so much. So if you turn your revenue engine off now, then where do you go? This is just a quick reminder you're listening to Marketing Trek, the Resisting Recession special powered by Selby Anderson with me. Dom Hawes. Coming up on the podcast, we look at why the current interest rate environment in the UK isn't as abnormal as you think. Steve and I also discuss why 2023 will be known as the year of big uncertainty. And Steve gives some really important advice for what marketing leaders need to remember in the coming months. But first, I really wanted to continue my discussion with Steve about cutting marketing. And he explains how what you don't do can hurt you in a few months time. Let's go take a listen. I mean, we're in this weird year, but as you say, the markets are tough. Is it also interesting that, you know, the canary in the mind, we're constantly looking for leading indicators because we're like many businesses, you get to a certain stage and you realize all you're doing is measuring the past. And actually what you want to get is some foresight into the future. So what, what leading indicators are there? I hadn't actually thought about looking at the, the wider investment market because actually a lot of our clients are B2B SaaS. And, you know, obviously we know they're operating in a tight environment. Obviously we know that they're having to restrict some of the activity they do because one of the challenges with market, marketing, as well as a growth engine, there's also quite a lot of fun stuff. It's quite easy to spend quite a lot of money on stuff that isn't going to move the dial and isn't going to build the brand long term, but might be quite fulfilling. So it's interesting. So this is something that for our own purposes, we're contemplating now, actually, because I liken your 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 marketing activity and, and that's a very broad expression yeah, yeah. marketing activity we'll but run with it it's fine the just social media engagement yeah, yeah I'm, I'm having to write my own blogs oh no <laughs> Steve I, I know I mean times are really tough but, but the point is when, yeah. when you've got a sophisticated team yeah. not only not only do you have the facility of having people write your blogs for you but actually you're a grown up company you should have someone write your blog yeah. for you yeah. um, because it's the right thing to do um, yeah. you, you're busy you, you can't rush these things but we're rolling our sleeves up and writing our blogs now and it's like oh I've got to do another one. I've, we only did the one two weeks ago, but it's essential. You've got to keep that cadence up. And I talk about having a digital breadcrumb trail. Yeah. So when we go fundraising for Fund 2, there's a maturity and a longevity to the story yeah. that we've been weaving. What you do now is you, you'll thank yourself in six That's months for true. what you're doing now. Yeah. You can't do it retrospectively, unfortunately. That's why we're here, you see. Because yes. A, a podcast, it's easier to talk into microphone than it is to write a blog. And B, yes. you're doing all the work for us. Too, yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah. Great, I'll, I'll leave you my invoice. Perfect. So, look, what do you what do you what do you think about the rest of twenty twenty three? Do you think anything's going to change? Do you think it's going to ease, or do you think that like this is where we are now for the year? It will certainly change. There's no doubt about that. I'm not an economist, but I think there is talk of perhaps one more interest rate increase, and then 
things will stabilise. When they'll start coming down again, who knows? If they'll come down again, who knows? I mean, it's very easy to forget that the interest rate environment that we've enjoyed, yeah. well, the bankers haven't enjoyed it, but everyone else has enjoyed for the last, what, 15 years? In fact, it goes back to 2011, actually. But the ultra-low interest rate environment is, is abnormal. It's an anomaly in the yeah. grand scheme of things. And people are now worried about paying 5 or 6% on their mortgage. Well, yeah. that's normal. That's, that's what, what we did uh, back in the day. Uh, we're <laughs> aging ourselves now. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, but of course, the difference is it's a completely different environment now because there's a disconnect between people's earnings and the average house price. So arguably, people can't afford... Because an interest rate is just a measure to control people's spending. That's all it is. Um, so arguably, the steady state should be lower. Yeah. But yeah. The, below 1%, I, I can't see us going back to those days, I have to say. Yeah, well, let's not get into house price correction because I'll start crying. No. What about Brexit? I mean, let's just talk. We don't really much like talking about politics, but it's unavoidable if you're in business. How are you seeing in, in like B2B tech? Are you seeing a big impact? Or is it is it your investments clients who are dealing with complexity or... I'm not asking your personal view because I wouldn't be so obtuse. No, well, I, I, find, it very, I the... find it very difficult not to opine and not to get on my soapbox <laughs> when I'm asking on, that question about then. Brexit. But on, um, John Major recently put it far more elegantly and far more articulately than me. He was yeah, far more elegant in, in his saying, but it was a catastrophic mistake in my opinion. Why we would want to set out on our own in the current global environment. And yes, arguably it has deteriorated significantly in many ways, shapes and forms since post-Brexit. But it's an increasingly complicated and complex world and, and all these issues are interdependent. And there, are, as John Major was saying, there are three major blocks, obviously North America, Europe and Asia. Why we'd want to turn our back on being part of a, a block and all the, the security. And, and it's, again, it's like leaving a, an established organization going into startup. Yeah. Well, it's why, why do we choose to do that in this current hostile environment the optimist in me thinks yes we'll be fine but we have chosen a harder path there's no question right now it seems to me that there's a lot of debate around brexit not not least because of the northern ireland, northern ireland protocol and it's it, all we want as businesses really is stability we just want a stable platform so we can get on and trade and there's a lot of distraction going on not least the government our own government other than being competent, what would you like to see them do to support businesses? I joked about this earlier, but I'm going to say it on the podcast, I think they should grow up. Yeah. Our government has been embarrassing for almost the entire... I'm, I'm, I'm not a Tory basher, but they, yeah. they, make, they make it hard. Um, yeah. I, am, look, I was a Tory. I was, I say. It's hard. It's really hard. Yeah, it's, it's, it's embarrassing. The, 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 democracy is the least worst solution. Yeah. The, the current government are demonstrating why it doesn't work. Corporation tax, right? 19 to 25%. Does that make sense? No. No. Of course it doesn't. Do you think Jeremy Hunt's going to listen to anyone? No, of course he won't. Dear, dear. Okay, so we've got a year of recession. We've got a government that's at sixes and sevens. So this year is definitely going to be another year. And probably next year, some of it, a year of big uncertainty, I guess. That's the challenge, to your point, that's your challenge for business. It's the uncertainty. It's not yeah. knowing what you're dealing with. In the environment I'm, I'm in, fintech in particular, there's been lots of changes to, I mean, regulation, regulatory change is constant. It's, it's always happening. But there have been changes to the R&D grants and, and the environment on that. And just the uncertainty that that creates. I mean, it's hard enough building a business and creating jobs and giving people the ability to put food on the table as it is without the government coming along and interfering and meddling. Leave it alone. Yeah. I think the R&D thing is massive from a marketer's point of view as well. I mean, thinking specifically about product marketers, you know, a large part of the testing and the innovation that was fueling hopefully going to fuel our economy in the future, was going to be supported by government R&D. And I don't think anyone knows where they stand at the moment. No, so the promises that were made in the Brexit debate, bringing that ugly thing back to the table, but the, the, the promises that were made about how, how how the subsidies would be, the European subsidies would be, watching Clarkson Farm the other day about the European farming subsidies being replaced. Well, actually, they haven't been. These are the, the, promise, the promises haven't been made. And in business, you, you have to shoot with a straight dice. If you want to grow a business, you have to be reliable, consistent, yeah and treat people fairly but but if you're having to deal with complexity adversity and and goalposts moving created by your own government in the background that's it's just not helpful but it is where we are it is i mean that is literally where, is we, where are, we are 23 and 24 so if a business is made out of two things right the core of a business or the value creating part of a business is innovation and then taking that innovation to market given that innovation is getting harder where well, it's certainly not being supported and trading is kind of hard what do you think marketers need to, i mean marketers in the broader so sense what do you me, think they need to be thinking so for me it's quite simple never lose sight of what it is that you're doing never lose sight of who your customer is 
is. And one of the things that I learned very early on, I need to sanitize this statement for the audience, but your customer doesn't care about you yeah. or your business. All the customer cares about is what problem you are solving for them and how you are doing it. And you're either saving them money, you're either making them money, you keep keeping them out of jail or you're engendering yeah. social benefits. Never lose sight of the problem that you're solving and who your customer is. Yeah. And obviously, if you've got a big enough problem and a bigger customer based or a bigger target audience to go for and you execute well, then you can grow a meaningful business. But the companies that fail are the companies that lose sight of what their mission is. They lose sight of who their customer is yep. and how they're helping their customer. And constantly reinforce and demonstrate to your customer. You talk a lot, a lot of SaaS companies. SaaS is, is, is an overhead on the account every month. It's a cost. Yep. So you have to constantly demonstrate the return on investment that they're getting for that investment. Yep. That, that black line every, every month, that, that line on the accounts every month. You keep doing that, and, and marketing is a big part of that. Yeah. And the other thing, the other role that marketing plays is it, it drives the myth, drives the legend. I was, okay. I, I was doing a blog post the other day, and, and I, was, I was asked to, what's, what's my one business book I'd remember, uh, recommend? And it's always Start With Why by Simon Sinek, because people buy into what you believe and, and what you can do for them. You ask anyone at any company, most people can articulate what it is that they do. Many people can articulate how they do it, but not many people can articulate why it is that you're doing it. What is, what is the problem you're solving? What is it you believe? And I think marketeers have to constantly be mindful of that and constantly keep that narrative in, in, in the public domain and constantly be in the public domain. You start cutting costs and hiding into the background, people will naturally think, where have they gone? Yeah. And it makes people nervous about continuing to spend, especially with SaaS companies. Good. Okay. So I, I really like that. So marketing... Marketing is there to remind the business why their customers are buying it so everyone can focus on the right stuff. And we focus uh, value prop, really. So we're focusing right back down to the value prop. Keep reminding the business, this is our value prop. This is what we need to keep reminding our customers about. That's a good role for a marketer to be doing in tough times, I think. Absolutely. But obviously, we were talking about this before we started recording. Marketing is more than just messaging and and, yeah. and and championing the cause it's all the analytical stuff yeah it's all the sales enablement you know you don't have marketing and sales sales and marketing work hand in glove yeah. and in fact sales marketing and product should all work hand in glove talk to the customer understand what the problem is understand yeah. how you can fix it understand how you can segment your audience and, and focus on how you go about customer acquisition and tweak the proposition f f for an audience one of the uh, the key learnings we had at Currency Cloud was you can't be all things for all men, but you can be very, very good if you just tweak your proposition a little bit per audience Okay, and have specialist teams focusing on different segments. It makes a huge difference just talking to them in their own language and talking yep. about their own problems as opposed to a generic message. Yep. Generic message makes sense to you because you're passionate about your business, <laughs> but, but you can't go to market with a generic message. You have to be much more specific. Tailored to market, yeah. Yes. Perfect. Well, look, time marches on and we like to finish everything with like a nice big flourish of advice. So, but this is for marketing leaders. So specifically for people in marketing leadership roles, what advice would you give them for the, for the year or two ahead of us? Get out of the boardroom and talk to customers. Yeah. For, for me, the most important thing is never lose sight of who is paying the bill. Yeah. Never lose sight of who is buying your service and yeah. why. And you need to test that theory at all levels. Yes, you could have conversations with contemporaries around the board table in terms of why you're doing this big multi-million SaaS deal. But you also need to go down to the users and understand yeah. what it is that they get out of it as well. And, and everybody in between. Okay. It's, it's never lose sight of the problem that you're solving for the customer and obsess about making it better. Keep talking to customers. Brilliant. Well, that's the end of the podcast for today. This series is short and sweet. I very much hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Steve, for coming on the show. It was a really great conversation. I've known Steve for a number of years and I always, always really enjoy his company. I'd like to end every episode of this special six-part series just with one key tip for how marketers can resist and respond successfully to recession. And there's been a lot of insight shared today, but for me, something that really stuck out is what Steve said coming towards the end of the podcast when he identified why companies fail. They fail because they lose sight of the problem they're solving for their customer and, most often, who their customer actually is. This is great advice when times are good, let alone when financial pressure and potential failure threatens many businesses. The problem you're solving and who you're solving it for, that's kind of the essence of great marketing. And if you're a business leader who needs a mantra to refocus your company's strategy around, you won't find one more valuable than that. 
next week on the podcast, we're going to continue this very special six-part Resisting Recession series. And as this is ostensibly a marketing show, we're actually going to bring a marketer in, but not any old marketer. We have the amazing Robert Norum coming to talk to us, who's been in the business for many years. He is steeped in ABM smarts. He is B2B Marketing's ABM trainer, or certainly has been for many years. He's helping one of our agencies out at the moment. Um, He's an amazing guy. And if you haven't listened to Robert talk, you need to. And he thinks he has a particular take on account-based marketing that is the answer to recession. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You're going to have to tune back in and listen. It is worth your time. Now, just before I go, I would like to tell you that you can find detailed show notes and sometimes extras at marketingdifference.co.uk. You can also register there to make sure you don't miss any important shows. And I'd also like to ask you a personal favour. If you've enjoyed the show, please tell a couple of your colleagues about us or maybe consider rating and reviewing this show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It's your call, of course, but I'd be grateful because it takes us around eight hours to make each show, but only around 30 seconds to review it. Marketing Trek is conceived and produced by Selby Anderson with creative support from One Fine Play. Nicola Fairley is executive producer. Connor Foley is the series producer. Kazra Ferruzio is the audio engineer and editor. And the episode is recorded at terminalstudios.co.uk. See ya!